Hello, everyone. Welcome, uh, welcome to my talk tonight. And I'm Shirley. Uh, thank you for Paul's introduction. And I uh, work with Steve Barth and Annette Pages from Thoreau, the postdoc there. Um, as we may know that our human beings will feel uncomfortable in a temperature of more than 40 degrees. However, do you know that some living organisms out there, they can live perfectly in a boiling water. So first, I have a question for you. So do you know what's the um, upper limit temperature for the living organism on Earth? Could you give me a number? I have a gift for you. Give me a number, guess a number. Oh, that's too much. <laughs> Any number? Hmm? Body or or the, the, the temperature of the environment they live. Come on. That's close. Keep going. Keep down a little bit. <laughs> Who, who's that 120? Okay, great. <laughs> you have my gift. Yeah, okay, so that's close. <laughs> that's the closest answer. So, this string is called string 1 to 1 because they can live very well in a temperature of 1 to 21 degrees. So that's the correct answer. And they were isolated from a high temperature sea floor hydrothermal vent. So today I'd like to share some of my, the exciting findings of my postdoc um, project talking about how the microbes live in such an extreme environment and what the geo-evidence they live for us. And also I will talk about the, the minerals which share the similar texture to the um, biotechnical activities, but they perceive it in a, a biotic way. And uh, I think you are familiar with it. And uh, as a uh, uh, video I have shown you before, so this is a deep sea hydrothermal vent, and they keep discharging the black or white hydrothermal fluid on the sea floor. Here, the fluid is black because they contain a lot of fine-grained sulfides. So this kind of the vents, they enrich the sulfide and also some pressure metals. Uh, they also have other name called chimney or black smokers. Because this is uh, ideally what it looks like, but usually occurs like uh, the, the, v the image shows that it consists of a lot of fun, uh, small chimneys. They're also very important habitats for the microbes and also the other organisms. For example, you can see a lot of shrimps, the crabs, they live happily here. How do we form a chimney? First, you need the very active magma at the depth of sea floor, and the heat will promote the circulation of the sea water within the ocean and the crust, and they will leach the metals to generate the metal-rich ore fluid. And the ore fluid will flow along the fissures or the fractures to come to the surface of the sea floor and mix with the sea water to form these beautiful chimneys and the home for these living organisms. So the hydrothermal venue fluid is usually quite high temperature, which can be up to 350 degrees or up to 400 degrees, and it's very acidic with a pH around 2 to 4, and the, it, it enriched in the metals and sulfides. So this is a cross-section view of the chimney, and the basic it features with the center the high temperature copper right here, and they will transit to low temperature minerals. Because in the different part of chim chimney, they involve the different mixing degrees of the hot hydrothermal fluid and cold sea water. So that's a basic temperature degree from high to low temperature from the center to the outer part. The microbes are widespread with the chimney and structures. For example, the scientists, they have isolated some hypothermal and phallic ion reducer within the chimney structure. And also in the plumes, Scientists have suggested that the micro play a very important role in transporting the metals such as copper and the iron. Also in the low temperature diffusion vents, there are some other like metallic iron oxidizer have been isolated from them. Those microbes have been suggested to play a very important role in the cycling of metals and precipitation of the minerals within the chimney structure. However, there are some um, questions unsolved. First is, what's the diversity of the biominerals? Um, previous studies gener generally focus on the iron-rich sulfide or iron oxide, but whether the micro will contribute to the precipitation of other sulfides, we don't know yet. Secondly, in some um, hydrothermal, hydrothermal vents, oh, sorry, hydrothermal 
field, particularly from the manual station, the arsenic is very high there. They can be up to 1,000 micrograms per liter, which is 1,000 times than they have in the water, or in the sea water. So how this microbes deal with or living in such a toxic environment, we don't know yet. And how to distinguish minerals they can precipitate from the um, both orange like biotic or abiotic process, we don't know yet. So it's very significant to study the seafloor hydrothermal vent. First, they have been suggested to be the modern analogs of the ancient VMS deposits, which are very important resources for the base metals such as copper and zinc and all precious metals like gold and silver. So to understand how the chimney forms, it can help us to better understand the ore forming process of the ancient ore deposit. Secondly, it's very interesting part is they have been suggested to be one of the possible um, location where the life has been origin. It's, um, so to study the biominerals in the chimney, uh, they can provide the, like the insight into the similar life behavior on the, on the early earth and also provide the biosignatures We can help you to find more like early life evidence. The seafloor hydrothermal vent is a very unique system because it involves both hydrothermal process and also the biological process. So in such a complex system, they will generate some uh, very interesting and particular assemblage of the bound minerals, which can be the potential proxy to look for the more ancient or, uh, VMS deposit. Um, also, I'd like to share some background of the bound minerals because um, also you are geologists. So the bound minerals means uh, the mineral, mineralization happens associated with my biological activities, and the minerals will start, uh, usually like carbonate, sulfide, and iron oxide. And the process related to the formation of minerals is called biomineralization. There are two types of biomineralization. First is a biological induced mineral mineralization, which means that the minerals precipitate out of the cell and they an interact, uh, involved interaction with the byproducts of the metabolism. For example, this is a sulfur reducing bacteria and a lot of the iron sulfide precipitate around it. How does it form? So this is a sulfur reducing bacteria and they will reduce the sulfate to hydrogen sulfide. Then the hydrogen sulfide will interact with the iron in the solutions. So usually they will precipitate the flammable part, which is very common in the in geological records. The other type is called biological controlled uh, mineralization, which means the mineral precipitates within the cell itself and the element gets involved into the uh, metabolism. For example, in this, in this example, this is uh, some magnetite and the, the iron is involved into the um, metabolism and the, pre, the, cell, the bacteria precipitates the magnetite within the cell structure. There are some bulk minerals that have been found in ancient VMS deposit. For example, this is a silica rich tubes which have been found from a 440 million years VMS deposit. And the nanotomography shows very beautiful distribution of these tubes. However, we, um, it's unknown that how they form, what kind of mechanism result this tube structure. There's an early nature paper published by Berger in 2000, and he found these filamental structures in the Sulphur Spring VMS deposit in West Australia. This filamental structure is very similar to the filamental bacteria, which have been isolated from the modern aqueous solution to show the, the biogenicity of this kind of the, the filamental structure in Asian rocks. More interesting, there's a nature paper published in 2017. They found this hematite tubes, which is in the oldest hydrothermal vent precipitate. And they also find this uh, iron-rich filament precipitate within the uh, tubes. So then they interpret that this is the oldest life evidence. That's why they published on nature. However, this evidence, a lot of people uh, have some question about it because in terms of the sizes, it's like micro scale, actually it's too big for the microbe at that time. So the bulk minerals have been found in ancient VMS, they were either very rare because they're not very common, or some the um, evidence they are quite disputed. So that's why we need to uh, investigate the microbe and matter interaction in the modern settings which can 
so first we can know the what is the really um, how to say the mechanism happens so we can provide the in, uh, understanding of them there may be a similar process happened in that time or they can provide the bowel minerals which can aid you to look for the real bowel minerals in the Asian VMS deposit. So this is my chimney sample I have studied for more than two years. And this is from the Manus Basin near the Papua New Guinea. It's, uh, it's here, so it's a back arc basin, so along the uh, New Britain trend here, and it's result from the Solomon microplate penetrate into the Bismarck plate here. Uh, I won't explain too much about tectonics here because it's not the point. And the, basically I studied the hydrothermal fields from the eastern Manus Basin, so they developed quite a lot of the hydrothermal fields. And they generally hosted by the basalt, desite, and anthite. And my sample came from the satanic mills. So this is a chimney, it's, it's a multiple, um, it's contained multiple conduit chimneys, so it's not that pretty one as we expected, but there's a lot of interesting story from it. So in the black area, you can see a lot of holes there. So this is the conduit where the fluid passing by. And in the yellow, yellowish area is dominated by the chalk pyrite. And the greenish area is the basic surface with the sphalerite. And some um, brownish to dark area is dominated by the barite. This chimney sample is enriched in copper, zinc, lead, and gold silver. So how do I characterize? So basically, I applied a wide range of analytical tools to calculate sample from macro scale to micro scale and even to the nano scale, as you will see later. later. So first, we apply the thorough in-house tornado and the Maya mapper, which has a X microbing X-ray fluorescence microscope, which can give you a very good understanding of the distribution of a different elements and minerals. So it's very powerful and non-destructive samples. Then we we found some area of interest and we make them into thin sections and observe them with optical microscope, FEM scanning, electron microscope, coupled with different detectors and also the some um, coupled with the Australian X-ray XRF, X-ray fluorescence microscope. Here I'd like to emphasize a little bit about the EBSD, which is the electron backscatter refraction, which can give you a very good idea of the uh, microstructure of this sulfide. And for some particular microbial social textures, which are usually very small, like nanoscale, so we will use a, a FERX ion beam to prepare samples and we observe them with a TEM, the transition electron microscope. So this is a, I like to show a little bit of the mineralogy because of the geologist of the chimneys. And so this is a cross section view of the chimney. It looks like pumpkin, but it's not. So in, in the Chalk pyrite dominant zone, so it's basically uh, features with the multiple conduits chalk pyrite and the yellow base is, is chalk pyrite, but it's difficult to see the distribution of other elements. So I also masked with a more colorful image. So this is a synchron XF3 element map. So iron is red, represent chalk pyrite, and the copper is green. So the yellow, is, yellow, base, uh, yellow part is a chalk pyrite, and the blue is a zinc, represents sphalerite. So we can see basically the, the red part is the um, pyrite overgrows the chalk pyrite conduit and the um, sphalerite overgrows um, both of them. So these are features in the chalk pyrite dominant zones. And in the chalk pyrite um, sphalerite transition zone, oh, sorry, forgot to mention one thing. The very interesting point is if you go back, if you zoom in this area, Basically, we can see that the chalk pyrite transits from the dendritic structure to your hydro structure. It's not that clear here, so we zoom in again, so you can see more clear. So you can see the dendritic structure here and the hydro structure here. So these structures represent that the, the chalk pyrite is precede from a very super, super saturated conditions to the super, uh, to the saturated conditions. In the um, chalk pyrite sphalerite transition zone, basically that's uh, over. Overlaying with the same image and uh, uh, with a synchron image with the same color scheme, and the sphalerite basically occurs like a massive or column structure here. And in the sphalerite dominant zone, here I use another color scheme. So red represents the chalk pyrite, and the green represents sphalerite, and blue is the barite. 
So it's not that pretty, and because the sphalerite occurs by dendritic structure and uh, the intergrowth with uh, sphalerite. And our micro basically occurs in the, uh, from sphalerite to um, um, barite uh, um, dominant zone here, and I will introduce you now. So the first type of the film, uh, microbiactive um, um, biominerals is a kind of filament. So basically it occurs within the barite and sphalerite dominant zone here. So the green is sphalerite and blue is the barite. And this will overlay with the lead arsenic uh, maps. So we can see some filament which occurs as a yellow color, which is like the composite of lead and arsenic, which means that this filament is enriched a lot of arsenic and lead. And uh, the red, red spot here is the real gold, which is arsenic sulfide. When we observe, we, we observe the similar textures on the unpolished surface, so we can see this amazing the clusters of the filament, which are attached to the surface of barite. And we continue zooming in, so we can find this filament, or this, the clusters com composed of the, film, the, the stacked filament. And you can see that each of the filaments, uh, how it attached to the surface of barite, and some silica spills nuclear on them. And the, and the very thin, very small, and less like around nano scales. This is what it looks like on the polished surface. Basically, it's um, clo sure close association with the barite here and some sulfides. And we'll continue zooming in here. One more. So we can see the filament and the form this networking structures and touch on the surface of barite and sulfide here. And also a lot of the, the so we choose a favorite spot and use a FERX and bin to remove the materials around it. Then we use a manipulator which can, which can lift it out within the SEM. And uh, we make them the grade, which are very thin, like less than 100 nanometers, and we can observe them with the TEM. So this is a scanning TEM observation, so we can see the filament are very bright. Here, because we already know that this filament, they have been mineralized to lead arsenic min uh, minerals, because lead is very heavy. So in this image, they show very bright mineral here. So more brighter means more dense element. And they are very thin, like each, the width of them is less than like 30 nanometers. So we continue to mean we find very interesting things. This filament, they contain a core and a shell structure here. Um, Kaylee from the Curtin University have helped me to perform like the 3D tomography videos I can show to you. So you can see how they rotate, when the sample rotating in 3D, how it looks like in a 3D view here. It's amazing. Okay, so we performed the EDS element map to confirm the, um, to try to find the, the, the distribution of different, men, um, different elements. So basically, as I mentioned, that they, they include the core and shell structure. So the shells is enriched in carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, which are very important component of organic matter. And the core is, is enriched in lead, arsenic, and phosphorus. So this is a cross-section view here. We can see in the center is a very enriched in lead here. So the currency of the carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus shows that this micro, so show that this element is are biogenic. So our filaments, they include a core uh, with a lead arsenic sulfur salt and a shell with an enriched of organic matter here. So we compare the structure with a similar structure in the published papers, and then we found this kind of the unoxidizing bacterial. So this is a bacteria, and this is stalks when they produce the, when they move. And then at the inter interface between the between the um, bacteria and the stalks, they also have the similar core and shell structure. So in their interpretation, they suggest that when the micro move, they will oxidize the ferrous ion to the ferric ion to get the electrons for this, uh, to provide the energy for the microbe activities. And the, the, mi the microbes, they will uh, excrete the extracellular um, polymetric materials, which can bond the ferric ion to form these kind of structures. In terms that our uh, filament have a similar core and shell structure, so we interpret they are uh, precipitated from the similar microbial metabolism activities, but which element is involved in this metabolism is a 
So it's a question for us. So we need to come back to our rocks to try to find more evidence. Luckily, we found that filament actually have a very close association with the real guard, the, the arsenic sulfide. Before I have show, I have shown this image to you that the clusters of the filament are attached to the surface of sulfides, but they don't penetrate into it. And however, there's another type of the, it's a cluster of the filament, but they actually they penetrate into the real guard, the arsenic sulfide. We also observe that the cluster of filament, filament they overgrow this real guard. If we zoom in this part, we can see the, how the individual filament penetrate into these minerals and they try to dissolve it. So this is, uh, um, we think this is uh, like the original crystal uh, uh, shape of the real guard and this is how it after erosion. Also we observe some filaments that are included in the silica fields. So due to they have such a close association between the real guard <coughs> And this filament, we propose we can we propose that maybe something uh, the micro will use arsenic to pre to precipitate this kind of the filament. So what's the mechanism behind it? So we compare the chemical structure of the both elements. First, for the lead arsenic sulfur salt, actually they have the arsenic three plus here, and for the real gar, actually it's a very complex mi complex minerals and does not have a one type of the oxidation state. This is a, a structure unit. We can find that the purple is arsenic and the yellow is sulfur. So we can, we can see that the arsenic sometimes bound with uh, and sulfur and sometimes bound with the uh, arsenic. So we interpret, we find that actually in the real guard, there are multiple oxidation states instead of arsenic within it. So our interpretation is the microbes, they will oxidize arsenic from the real guard and to precipitate arsenic three plus to get the electrons for the, en for the energy. And then the arsenic will precipitate together with lead and sulfur into its, uh, the EPS, the actual cellular polymatic substance. So that was one story. And I have very, another very exciting story to share that we also find that the sphera, they were rimmed by a thin layer of the filament. So in this, this is a synchron image as well. So the red represents the clusters of the filament. And if we zoom in, in the higher magnification image, some part that occurs at the elongated structures. We also find similar elongated structures on the, on the unpolished surface. So this is the elongated structure, and if we continue zooming, actually they consist of filament exactly the same like we have observed before. So what do we do? Do we still use the focus iron beam to try to find a favorite area and to, uh, perform, um, to prepare the TEM grade? So this is TEM grade, and this is sphalerite and a lot of filament um, attached on the surface of it. And we found one spot and zoom in. It's very interesting. So this is a, this is a sphalerite. And instead of it form like homogeneous sphalerite that we see before, actually they contain a lot of dendritic structure, which means actually the edge of sphalerite is very dendritic and it's porous. And the, this is the filament that penetrates into this um, sphalerite. This is a scanning TEM, as I told you before, that the brighter mineral will, it means the, uh, the heavy, uh, sorry, the heavier mineral will show the brighter colors. So we can see how this um, filament get um, penetrated into sphalerite, this mineral. There's another interesting thing we found out that I zoom in this part and you can see, so this is a, this is a tube. And in the silica field part, it's an actual empty tube without a core. But within the sphalerite, actually there's a core here. That means the microbes may eat some part of, uh, may eat the sphalerite to precipitate the core inside. Because we already know that the filament is associated with arsenic-related mi uh, related microbial metabolism. So is there any arsenic in the sphalerite? Because it's not very common in the rocks. Uh, in, in the mineral or in the ore deposit. Anyway, so we performed the uh, electron micro, microprobe work to see if any arsenic here. Surprisingly, we found that around 4 weight percent of arsenic. So that's it possible the arsenic will act to some roles to these microbes. So we think we propose a hypothesis that sphalerite could be a potential microbe habitat. So what's a role? They could be play like a physical role, like a shadow to protect this microbe. Alternatively, they can provide like a 
the, the source for food for these microbes. So the testing is on the way. We don't have answer yet, but we are going to the central Melbourne uh, at Melbourne to test the oxidation state of arsenic over the sphalerite to, to test the water role of the sphalerite here. What, um, what's the significance for this study? We all know that arsenic, they have been identified a serious risk to human, human beings, but not only, for human, uh, not only for human beings, but also for a lot of living organisms, as you know. And in early days, scientists have found some um, arsenic oxidizing bacteria, and then they said it raised uh, public interest, and the ABC published that the arsenic eating bacteria can help us hunt for ET. At the beginning, I was quite a doubt about this. And later, I found a paper published in Nature Geoscience that they talk about the microbial arsenic cycling, which is in a very old stromatolite from the Western Australia. They, they show that actually in, the, this, um, in this very old rocks, the microbe will play very, uh, will, they were eating or digesting the arsenic within the body. And it's very, uh, also other scientists have then, then, sorry, then proposed that arsenic related to metabolism, they can play a very important role such driving the life evolution on Earth. It totally makes sense because on the early Earth, uh, in the Precambrian Ocean, it's full of arsenic because a lot of acti uh, volcanic activities. Yeah, actually, um, actually, uh, also scientists' uh, research have shown that the early Earth and the Mars are very similar. So that's totally, um, totally the possible that the arsenic eating bacteria that can help us to hunt for ET or some other living organism on Earth. Oh, sorry, on Mars, other planet. However, the example I just showed, this is the only geological evidence from the ancient rocks. So that means we need to find more evidence to support this. So that's why we study the, the microbe activity in such an extreme environment like seafloor hydrothermal vent. So they can provide the insight of similar behavior on early Earth and also provide the bound mineral to help you find more similar um, uh, microbe activities on early Earth. Okay, we also find other types of microbe activity. For example, this is, uh, you can see out of the filament occurs here, is the obs observation from optical microscope. This is occurs in barite sphalerite dominant zones. And the surprise is actually they're enriched in arsenic and lead, and they're very close. So we first take a look at the arsenic rich tube. Yeah, and uh, Compare the image with the SEM observation. So this is a cross-section of the most of tubes and they are gener generally embedded in the resin. So we use the FERX and beam to cut them so we can have a good view of the look, what it looks like in the vertical profile. And then we continue zooming. So, so these are the cross-section view of the tube and they're filling with some, looks like filamental stuff or other, other things. Um, the interpretation art here is we also, uh, when we look at inter uh, literature, and we found that type of microbe called schist microbes, and they were living in the tubes. The tube is a kind of the actual cellular polymetric materials. And when the microbe lives, they will leave the tube there, and the tube will later be mineralized to, uh, with other minerals. So our inter interpretation for this kind of tube is they could be the similar schist. Uh, Chef, sorry, chef to protect this microbe here. And then we take a look over the, the lead rich part. So there's a lot of tubes here penetrating into the barite and embedded in the silicate field. And also the large cross section view of these tubes. We first do some element map to see what's the distribution of element. So it's interesting the whole film, the cross, whole cross section is. Um, enriched in arsenic and the uh, lead is only uh, for, uh, enriched in the center part and also in, on the rings of it. We also, we quite like cutting them, so we use the uh, iron fox bean to slice them as well. And this is what you look at, uh, zoom in. So this is a tube and actually there's a lot of the filaments living in it. So our interpretation to it is, it's still like a similar shape to, uh, to protect these microbes 
but the white form like the rings of arsenic lattice. So our interpretation is they could be result, uh, result from the, the chemical variation of the hydrothermal fluids and they keep growing over the chips. At the moment, uh, we keep this, uh, that's just my interpretation, interpretation, sorry, interpretation, and I just leave this open and uh, welcome to have other explanation here. In the very outer part where we have the barite garnizomes and the iron and the manganese crust, we find some microbial sulfur reducing activities. So in this zone, the overlap, this is central image again. So the, the purple, oh, sorry, the green is the, <laughs> the iron rich, iron manganese crust and the blue is the barite and you can see some doors. The dotted particles um, are enriched here and the, the <coughs> pinkish the light rich particles here. If we zoom in here, we found, oh, there's a lot of rainbow pyrite. I think most of you are very familiar with it. And this is a very a common product of the sulfur reducing bacterial activities here. If we zoom in here, there are very interesting things we found. Actually, there occurs a lot of the um, fine grain to the galena light rich that's sulfide, and they form a thin layering over the sparite here. If we zoom in, we can see here. So this, they, lot of, they leave a lot of holes in where the glina has left. So we interpret here is uh, the microbes, they will, ox they, they will reduce the sulfate from barite and precipitate lead to precipitate the fine-grained um, lead sulfide. Here we interpret is uh, like a um, detoxification process of the microbes. It's when the lead rich fluid passing by, the uh, in order to be poisoned, the microbes they will uh, reduce the sulfate to hydrogen sulfide and to precipitate lead to reduce the lead concentration in the surrounding uh, environment to protect itself. So I will have small um, conclusions for these bulk minerals in the chimneys. First, we have we found three types. The first type is associated with the arsenic oxid, arsenic-related microbial metabo um, metabolism that they will oxidize the ars they will oxidize arsenic from the real guard to precipitate like um, to phenocyte, the filament. The second type is the microbial sheath. They have been later um, mineralized from. Um, Mineralized into the arsenic, so, arsenic sulfide and uh, glaner during the late hydrothermal um, processes. And the third type is the uh, microbial sulfur reduction activities, and they can precipitate either the flammable pyrite or the fine grained glaner here. Also, I'd like to introduce what the um, structure, uh, microstructure of the minerals they precipitate from the hydrothermal fluid directly without the involvement of the, the microbial activities. So this is a sphalerite, which is very common in the um, hydrothermal chimneys. And usually people describe them as uh, massive or the coliform structures. And the, the right one is a central image. So the yellow part, they're all sphalerite. And you can see here the sphalerite includes a lot of small um, globular sphalerite, which is actually um, very similar to the flammable pyrite as you usually observed. So we performed the ED, EBSD, the electron backscatter um, fractionation. So we can, this technique, they can measure the, um, all the crystal, crystal orientation for all the crystals. So here we can see this sphalerite actually includes multiple of the globular sphalerite here, and uh, each of them includes a um, very porous center and uh, the elongated structure on the edge. In a higher magnification, an uh, image we can see that this is a quarter of the whole um, sphalerite. They include two zones. Zone, two, zone one with a fine grain sphalerite and zone two is a sphalerite with dendritic structure. The right is the inverse polar figures. Usually we use it to, in, to, uh, to see whether this uh, crystal have the same orientation because if they have the same color, usually they have the same orientation. And here it's very colorful, means that when the crystal grows, they don't have preferred orientation. So we interpret them, they are precipitated from the super, um, super saturated conditions when they precipitate. So we think it represents the process at the beginning of the mixing between the hot hydrothermal fluid or cold sea water. So at the beginning of their mixing, it's a, it's a 
the highly supersaturated, so the crystals, they were nuclear instead of, instead of growth. So that's why they form zone one with uh, fine grain particles. And during the continued mixing, the degree of the supersaturation, they decrease a little bit, so, and the crystals start to um, grow as dendritic structure. So that's how they form the zone two here. So we, th we think our uh, observations suggest that the very primary texture of the microstructures of a spheroid precipitate there. Because the several hydrosomal chimneys, they haven't suffered any hydrosome alteration, diagenesis, or metabolism. So this represents the primary textures. So we think we can uh, use a similar texture to uh, identify the primary or secondary textures in the ancient VMS deposit or a comparison with, between them. Okay, so almost end. <laughs> Thank you. So take home message here. So first, we found some extreme uh, the microbes that can live in such ex extreme environments like using the arsenic or. Um, so this bio mineral they can help us to trace the early life, and uh, we all, so the, the unique combination of the bio minerals they can be the potential proxy for the exploration of VMS deposit, and uh, the. We also find some new and primary micro uh, microstructure we can, which can help you to further identify or, uh, um, or understand the all forming process of the Asian VMS deposit. I have four months left for my postdoc work, so in the limited time, what I'm going to do is we're going to compare using the mineralogy and the microstructure of the sulfides from the both high, modern um, seafloor hydrothermal vent and also the ancient VMS deposit. So hopefully we can find something interesting as well, and also can have fun, um, hope also can find some early life from it as well. So in the end, first I'd like to acknowledge like our um, pioneer researchers in Saro, which in 1991 to 2000, they, they, uh, Ray Baines and Joanna Pa, they have a lot of cruise trips to collect those samples. And this is a Picpella um, chimney. This looks. This, this is what you look at when you collect it. I think you may be familiar with this image if you have come to Saro. So this is part of that one. These samples, they have been collected like for more than 20 years, but now uh, I applied some new techniques to characterize the more features from it. So as I won't say uh, even samples are very old, but they're very precious. So there are a lot of significance to still characterize it, and we can have a lot of exciting and very significant results from it. Uh, yeah, okay, I think I have shown this video before, so probably I'm not showed here. And uh, you want me to show that? No. Okay, I think I want to put my acknowledgement. It stopped me. Yes, come out. Okay. Yeah, so I'll show my acknowledgement to those people and thank you. Yes.